Hi, I'm Klaus, Klaus Mega. I'm a member of the uh, Food and Ag Grassroots Network team, um, core team member, and I'm also part of the uh, sub-team for federal uh, legislation and for the 4 per 1000 initiative, which Paul Mikkel and I co-lead. Co um, I did recently a PowerPoint uh, presentation to the Water Sentinels, and Elaine asked me to share that. So I had to redo it uh, to uh, you know, exchange a couple of slides, but let me share my screen and get to it. And uh, and let's get uh, to dig into it here. So the topic is soil and water conservation for food security and climate. So in particular, we wanted to explore the link between soil and water, uh, where the, the importance of the soil microbiome and its impact you know, on the small water cycle, the impact of chemicals on soil organic matter, and uh, you know what it takes to recarbonize the soil. And then let's have a conversation on who's using the water, uh, because approximately 80% of all water is used by agriculture. So how you know, does that break down into some greater detail? Talk about the pollution of watersheds, the depletion of aquifers, and then you now where do we go from here? Let's have you now a quick conversation. Um, so let's start with the soil microbiome. Soil supports you know, life on Earth. Basically, everything that lives on top of the of the of of, of the Earth uh, has is is either coming out of the soil or is being supported by what is coming out of the soil. Right. Um, it regulates the water cycle, and and we'll talk about this in in a little bit more detail on the next slide. It stabilizes our climate. It's the largest terrestrial sink for storing carbon. There's about three times more carbon in the soil than there is in the atmosphere. And it supports the microbial community that builds soil. Um, and so medium for plant roots, it's a medium for plant roots and plants, and it's necessary for photosynthesis. Photosynthesis being the process of plants converting sunlight you know, through their roots, you know, carbon and, and nitrogen and, and uh, and the other nutrients that go that go into the soil. So there are more nutrients. Uh, a teaspoon of soil you know, contains more microbes than there are people on the planet. So soil really is a living thing. You now, when you uh, reach into you know, uh, uh, a field with healthy living soil, you know, you, it, it bubbles inside, right? I mean, it's full of life. Um, so the small water cycle is something that just you know, recently came to my attention. Um, what it refers to is that you have you know, uh, large water coming in from the oceans that's being discharged over the land. Healthy soil, you know, in a in a uh, normal in a normal environment or in a uh, healthy environment, the soil you know, absorbs that water, holds on to it, you know, and and acts like a sponge. Then you have evaporation taking place, and so it's called evapotranspiration, which then stimulates the local water cycle. And so about 50-60% of normal rain is really due to this local cycling. Um, then, of course, when you have soil, large tracts of soil drying out uh, because of you know, the, uh, industrial use, um, this this cycle then gets disrupted, which meaning which means then we see longer periods of droughts, you know, interrupted by more intense rains, which cause problems because now the soil is dry, doesn't absorb the water, and so that's uh, that's the interaction here that we that we currently observe. Each one percent increase in soil organic matter helps the soil to hang on to twenty thousand gallons more water per acre. That's a big number. Um, and and you know, understand that uh, some soils can hold you know, three, four, five percent of carbon, even more. You know, some do less, but on average, three to four percent of carbon. So we're talking about significant volumes of water that uh, uh, that depleted so that's missing in depleted soils, you know, interrupting these water cycles. Then the impact of chemicals you know, on soil organic matter. So. Um, after World War II, you know, the industry discovered that you know, synthetic nitrogen made with uh, natural gas you know, is like a wonder truck you know, for 
uh, for crops to increase their productivity, their vitality, and all of that. Of course, what happened in the process of, of overusing uh, the synthetic nitrogen is that the plants become lazy. They don't uh, build you know, the deep roots, uh, which means it deprives the soil uh, uh, microorganisms of food, uh, which means they, they shrink, they get damaged, and eventually they die. Um, so, so that overuse hardens the soil, then it reduces soil fertility, you know, it pollutes air, water, and soil, and lessens important nutrients uh, in the soil uh, of soil and minerals, you know, bringing hazards to the entire environment, creating uh, yeah. problems with biodiversity, because other forms of life um, who normally live on this or as, uh, as part of this are now also being deprived uh, of, of, of nutrients. The big thing, so you know, as these as these monocrop fields, you know, huge monocrop fields are getting nourished uh, artificially, really, um, they now need to be defended against predation from weeds and insects, and so that's become that has become you now the local warfare here because you know, pests and weeds become stronger and more resistant and more resilient, so we have to use higher volumes of these of these pesticides. So this is leading to, you know, and I just want to point out one here, um, to some real issues with uh, glyphosate as one example here. Um, the, the, the amount of glyphosate that's being poured onto fields is just phenomenal. And so pretty much you know, the majority of the American population has residues of glyphosate uh, in their body, in their urine, um, particularly uh, with children, you know, um, I mean, showing ten to forty times, ten to forty times more than permitted in drinking water levels uh, of uh, of these chemicals uh, uh, in their in their system, and we know that glyphosate is a problem because Monsanto and Bayer lost you know, a huge more lawsuit, billion dollar lawsuit for, for Roundup, which is you know, the same thing uh, as what they're using in the farm fields. And uh, it's linked to you know, cancer and ADHD and autism and Parkinson's and kidney and Alzheimer's. It kills weeds, but it also has a lot of unintended consequences and, and, and which are profound and linked to modern day plagues. Um, I mean, women have uh, glyphosate in their breast milk. You know, the, the majority of uh, um, of uh, food when you when you think about uh, uh, it says eighty percent of the U.S. food supply, you know, is is uh, uh, is holding traces of, uh, of 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 glyphosate. Children's cereal, you know, it's in everything. Um, so that is that is you know uh, a huge byproduct uh, that we also you know have to be hugely concerned about, which you know, I mean everybody here understands. So let's. Uh, Let's take a look at what does it take to recarbonize the soil. Um, so that's re generally referred to as regenerative agriculture. Regenerative as opposed to sustainable. Sustainable was a great idea 30, 40 years ago when people realized that you know, we are extractive you know, in our form of, of, of farming and then we, we just you know, won't go on forever. So um, we need to become sustainable which when you think about European countries, we think about Japan, Vietnam, the Middle East, there are people who have lived on the same land for thousands of years without destroying their soil. So it is perfectly possible you know, to balance you know, what you take out uh, of the soil uh, and, and how you treat your soil with the needs to uh, feed a population. And, um, what comes out uh, of the of the soil in these countries is balanced with a diet, you know, with a menu that changes throughout the year depending on what's coming up uh, in the in the in the cycle in the agricultural cycles. So today we need to regenerate. That means we have to come back up to a condition that can be then sustainable, but we're below you know, the. Uh, a, 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 a crate of operating um, that could be considered sustainable. So we need to fix it, we need to repair it, we need to regenerate. 
And the way to do that is to minimize soil disturbance. It's to maximize crop diversity, keep the soil covered at all times, uh, maintain living uh, roots year round in there, and the integration of livestock. So you get biomass you know, into, into the soil, which you know, over millions of years has, has evolved into, uh, into a complementary process you now that keeps that keeps uh, uh, nature in good health um, positive externalities you know soil carbon sequestration of course um, th so the the you know the, there is there is you know generally an understanding that if we really scale this we could neutralize you know a pretty good part of that uh, co2 that's now going up into the atmosphere it has higher water infiltration, both in how much water it can hold per acre and how fast it can infiltrate water or absorb water. It improves human health. We now there's a clear understanding between the well-being of the soil microbiome and the value, the nutritional value of crops that come out of it and how that impacts our own you know, gut microbiome. Higher farm profitability, because you, lose, you have to use less uh, primarily... Uh, use less uh, chemicals, which is you know, the, one of the key cost drivers. Uh, and you also have to irrigate less uh, because the, the soil is has uh, natural moisture that it, that it keeps. You know, it's generally richer soils that uh, you know, have uh, uh, improved nitrogen, phosphorus, calcium, sulfur, and so on. And it increases ecological diversity because it feeds the entire biosystem around it. It, just, it doesn't just protects this one crop and kill everything else around it. So approximately 80% of all water is used by agriculture. So I have a little video here that I want to share because that uh, explains it much better than I could possibly do. So let's uh, let's take a look at it's that. everything you wish for. Your site traffic is sky. to listen at the moment. Until Advertising first. Yeah. Yeah, let's go. This represents all the water used in one year in the Western United States. For the past 20 plus years, a mega drought, made worse by man-made global warming, has left the West drier than it's been in over a thousand years. That includes the Colorado River system, where reservoirs have been depleted to record lows, which has people talking about ways to cut back. Cities are taking aim at the backyard swimming pool. Restrictions such as not washing cars at home and no power washing houses. Businesses and residents must cut their outdoor watering to just one day a week. But this is all the residential water use for 115 million people across 17 Western states. All the lawn watering and toothbrushing and pools and showers use only 6% of all water consumption. The rest of this, tells a totally different story. A team of researchers came up with these water use estimates, and they found that another 8% goes towards commercial and industrial uses, like offices, hotel fountains, mines, and power plants. Together with residential use, that's 14% of all water consumption in the West. All of what's left in here, the other 86%, is for growing crops. Irrigated agriculture is the big story. All the other water users added together don't come close to irrigated agriculture. In the dry western states, farms can't count on rain, so crops need irrigation. So here's soybeans, nuts, wheat, fruits and veggies, corn, but what's even more surprising is that the biggest share of this water goes to crops humans don't eat. The biggest water guzzler is alfalfa. You might not recognize this plant, but if you've ever seen a bale of hay that looks greenish, that's alfalfa. Unlike a lot of crops, with enough water, farmers in the West can harvest it up to 12 times a year and sell every last bit. It's about a nine to 10 month crop down in our part of the desert. And so you're farming it nine or 10 months, and, and therefore you're irrigating it during that time. We can group alfalfa's water with the water used for other grass hays and for corn silage. Together, this accounts for 32% of the West's entire water footprint. 
And what they have in common is that these are all crops grown almost exclusively to feed cows. That's more than all the residential and commercial uses combined, a third of all the water consumed in the West just for feeding cattle. Americans eat nearly four times more beef than the global average. Our dairy intake has been increasing for decades too, and we're not alone. At least 10% of this cattle feed ends up on container ships crossing the Pacific to feed cows in Japan, China, and the Middle East. Agriculture in the United States is built to supply a world export market. So what do we do about this? It's clear that letting our lawns die would make less of an impact than changing our diets. But that solution is a hard sell for consumers, even the most informed ones. In case anybody takes me for like a, um, a meat-hating like college professor, cheeseburgers are my favorite food. And my cheeseburgers come from Colorado River water. So I have thought about it. And uh, I think that before we all stop eating meat, uh, we should explore a couple of other solutions. Ben and his co-authors highlight an approach called rotational fallowing. It enables agencies representing metropolitan water users to set a price that they'll pay farmers to temporarily stop irrigating a portion of their fields. Farmers decide whether it's worth it in any given year to take that deal, and the unused water can then be sent to the cities or left in reservoirs. Can following pay in alfalfa in the Colorado River Basin solve the current 2022 year drought crisis? The answer is yes. There's a long-term agreement like this in place between the water district that serves LA and San Diego and the Palo Verde Irrigation District in rural California. The deal allows up to 29% of the total farmland to be fallowed. It's been largely well-received in our valley. I think farmers like it. Bart Fisher's farm depends entirely on water from the Colorado River, so he supports the conservation program. But he also says it doesn't work for everyone. You know, whenever you do following, there are economic losers and economic winners. And some of our vendors who may sell seed or fertilizer, uh, they're, they're a loser. Jobs, communities, and global supply chains currently rely on Western farmers growing vast amounts of cow food in the middle of the desert. But as water supplies continue to shrink, something has to give in how we eat, what we grow, and where we grow it. You know, when you look at the water use on the river, the short-term savings has to come out of agriculture. There's no there's no other place to get it. All right, so um, let's talk about you know, pollution of watersheds. The, the current agricultural runoff is the leading cause of water pollution you know, in the US. So water experts mark the 50th anniversary here of the Clean Water Act you know, with a dire warning after evaluating over 700,000 miles of rivers and streams across the country, they concluded that half of those waters are too polluted to fish or swim in, and agriculture is often to blame. So this is difficult politically, but we have to confront the fact that agricultural runoff is really the leading cause of water pollution in the U.S. today. Depletion of aquifers. So as we talked about, you now the soil is being depleted of soil organic matter, which means it can't hold on to the to to water. It can't it can't absorb it. It can't hold on to it, which then requires more irrigation. Now irrigation comes from groundwater, which in most cases, um, you know, takes long, long times, hundreds and thousands of years to fill up these, uh, these, these under uh, uh, ground uh, aquifers. And then the rivers, I mean, the Colorado River and the Mississippi River even you know, are, are at risk. And there simply is not enough water to continue doing what we're doing. Um, so, so where do we go from here? This is a really um, uh, sort of a, a breaker here to think about for a moment. You know, we just hit 8 billion people you know, a few weeks ago. And those 8 billion people today consume roughly 1.8 times the natural resources of the planet. 
meaning the the reproductive capacity of the plant is, is exceeded by a factor by a factor of 1.8 times. And the way that plays out is that nearly 90% of global fish stocks are either fully fished or overfished, uh, meaning that we pull out more fish than they can naturally reproduce. So the herd shrinks, the fish, the stock shrinks, the aquifers are being pumped dry everywhere, India, China, Europe, I mean, you name it. Um, and certainly here in the US, as we know. And then Earth has lost about one third of its arable land in the past 40 years. Now, spin that out you know we are supposed to be at 8.6 billion people by 2030 then you know wherever by 2050 um so so if you think of this as a bank account you know we have the ecological capital of the planet we are using we are every year eating into this capital base and every year we increase the demand of what we're taking out of this capital base so obviously it's a finite game and we can already see the the, the 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 visually, you know, what that really means if we continue, you know, to exploit the planet, the, the planetary resources at the scale that we are doing now. So the cost of doing nothing, um, I mean, the best case here is really pretty bad already. I mean, you, you know, you all are observing this on a regular basis. Um, we are already at a level of overshoot that's irreversible. And right? I mean, you have the Arctic ice melting, you have the Gulf Stream slowing down, you have uh, um, the climate patterns being disrupted, you know, because you know, the Gulf Stream is, is changing the heat and distribution across the planet. So this is water levels are rising. It's, it's unstoppable at this point. And all of this is happening much faster than we thought it could it would possibly happen because we don't understand exponential i mean the, these changes are, are coming at us at exponential speed the worst case and to just be clear and please you know google it look up the worst case here means you know that the planet will become uninhabitable to humanity you know there, there's no way that uh, this planet can hold can stand a three degree increase in average global temperature without changing life conditions to the point where we could not grow enough food you know we would uh, we would run out of resources you know, to survive in the way we function right now so the best case um, requires already you know some some serious adaptations and we're not aware of it i mean the population just still isn't quite ready for it um, so we're talking really about this range of intervention to say, well, how deep do we want to go here? And every day that passes without having that answered uh, makes things a whole lot more scary than they need to be. So, of course, from 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 you know, my focus and and you know, food and ag grassroots network focus you know, on on agriculture, agriculture is now. Uh, understood to contribute roughly one third of global emissions. When you take everything into account, the use of synthetic nitrogen, the decarbonization of soil, logistics, you know, shipping food around for thousands of miles, food waste you know, that creates carbon emission, uh, 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 methane emissions. When you put all of these things together, roughly one third you know, of global emissions are, are attributable to this current way of growing food and feeding the population mm -hmm. so if the carbon uh, uh, output of the energy sector were to stop today it wouldn't matter we, we, we are still you know, going across any kind of uh, for, uh, per, per, uh, imaginable threshold so we need to regenerate so you know changing you know uh, agricultural practices towards regenerative you no, know, you build organic matter in the soil, which increases the nutritional value of food. You know, helps solve you know these this healthcare crisis, which you know the majority of our healthcare cost is because of a dysfunctional diet, and it increases yield per acre. And by yield per acre, I mean calories per acre. It restores lives and habitats. You no, know, it retains water, prevents soil runoff. It could neutralize most of our carbon emissions and buy us time. Know, to shift away from fossil fuels into clean energy, agroforestry, energy efficiency. So putting carbon into the ground. Um, transitioning to regenerative organic agriculture um, 
the transition from industrial agriculture to will deeply impact the trillion dollar industry it will have global impacts um it's as it's it's as as big as as it is in the energy sector really when you think about it some business models you know particularly in the fast food and snack industry may just be unable to adjust I mean these may be our modern day Kodaks and blockbusters you know they just uh, you just can't do this anymore and uh their business models may be too rigid and to to uh, to adapt to a new reality so how can we help you know farmers need financial support to compensate for investments and temporary reduction in yields which is why we're spending time on the farm bill access to markets preferably through the active engagement and collaboration across the supply chain and connected to retailing this requires local action this requires local support you know to to uh, to connect farm to fork to connect farmers to markets mm -hmm. it requires educating the public you know tell others you know about uh, regenerative farming support regenerative farmers and producers by asking for local products in your grocery store in your restaurant uh, engage your caterer you know if you have kids in school talk to the school caterer your grocery store to support regenerative farmers and processes so there are a lot of things that we can do um on the policy level yes that's big but then I think super important now is to really educate uh in, in, get into the communities and really help people understand you know what this is why this is and how they can uh, individually uh, support uh, uh, these efforts here and make a difference so that was you know what I wanted to share here please if you have any questions just uh, shoot me an email or maybe we can uh, set up a conversation to follow up on this thank you very much